Frances Moore LePay is known around the world for her books and for a lifetime of activism on food, hunger, and democracy. She's now drawn all of that work over many years together um, into an inspiring message of hope for moving from our environmental crisis to truly sustainable ways of living. So please welcome Francis Moore LePay. Thank you so much. Wow, I've learned so much this morning. And um, I am just thrilled to be here. I want to also uh, recognize the World Future Council because I'm um, um, a counselor and World Future Council is part of the sponsorship. And thank you, Diane Moss, for your brilliant job. Um, so, I am excited to follow Don, because, and you'll see why when I get going in my talk. Earlier we heard from Dr. Lehman that if there is a barrier to 100% renewable, it's probably up here. It's probably in our heads. And I want to tell you uh, that that is what I finally began to realize, but I have to tell you something about how I got there. I, in the late 60s, I, had, I, I was a very desperate young woman trying to find direction. And I, a light bulb went off, and if I could just figure food out, food is basic. If the world isn't eating, what else matters? Maybe that would unlock the economics and politics that were so mysterious. So I just asked the simple question, why are people hungry? And there I am asking, huh, why is there hunger in the world? Because the newspapers were blaring that hunger was caused by scarcity of food, and I wanted to figure it out. So I took my dad's slide rule, literally, sat in the UC Berkeley library, and kind of added up the numbers, and I was in shock, because I realized that, no, there's more than enough to feed us all. Today, there are 20 to 30 percent more calories per person per day, enough to make us all chubby than there were when I was sitting in the UC Berkeley library. I was in shock. I realized that actually we were creating scarcity out of plenty. And so gradually, I uh, realized, of course, now, uh, my question, you know, why can't we see this? Why can't we see this? There are as many hungry people today as there were when I wrote Diet for a Small Planet in the late 60s. And now, why can't people see what we're hearing this morning? Why isn't it so obvious that we can do this? And we can do it beautifully with grace. Why can't people see it? Such a bright species, we're not getting it. So gradually, uh, it dawned on me that um, we can't see what is in front of our eyes because of a very special dimension of our species, that we don't see the world as it is, but through culturally formed filters that I like to call our mental map. And so several people have said it very eloquently. Albert Einstein in 1926, it is theory which decides what we can observe. And then Aldous Huxley said that all that we can and will and be ultimately in the last analysis depends on what we believe to be the nature of things. So I started asking, OK, what do we believe? I don't think in this room, but I think it's important. I don't think you share what I'm about to say in some fundamental ways. But what I'm trying to say is that what we see the world to be that blocks us, blinds us to what is, is in this room is something deep in our culture, a cultural filter that we must incorporate into our thinking if we're going to be effective. And so I want to just give you a, a very homey example of this. First, my thesis, believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. A homey example is that a couple Thanksgivings ago, I got up in the morning to make a root vegetable dish, and I dashed the cupboard to find my favorite Dutch oven to cook it in. But it wasn't there. And I looked in the basement. I looked in every cupboard I have, and I couldn't find it. I gave up. And then, about an hour later, I turned around, and there it was, only it had a plant in it. <laughs> I could not see my Dutch oven because I was looking for a cooking item. So if we are looking for the wrong thing, we won't even see what's right in front of our noses. And that is the human predicament. And so what is the cultural filter that I'm claiming that so much of certainly the United States, but we push globally? What is the nature of the mental map that we are trapped in that so blinds us? 
I call it the scarcity mind. I call it the scarcity mind, and it's all important. And it is made up of what I like to think of as the three S's, that, we are, that reality is made up of separate entities, that indeed um, things are pretty static, and that there's not enough scarcity. There's not enough anything from fuel to parking places in Boston where I live. Certainly not. So we live in this world that there's not enough of anything. And it's not just there's not enough goods. But what we absorb, I believe, particularly in my own culture, is that there's not enough goods or goodness. Because if we peel away the, the fluff of human nature, then what we can really count on is what? It is selfish little shoppers. That's what we kind of boil down to. So this, this scarcity mind, then, here is the problem with it. If, um, sorry, we've jumped ahead here. That's fine, though. But here is the problem with it. If we live in this scarcity mind, if we live in the scarcity mind, it creates a spiral of powerlessness. And this is, I think you will all agree with me, that the solutions to our problems, whether they be energy problems or food problems or you name it, they are known. Many of them we've been hearing about all morning. So if that's true and you agree with me, then the only thing we really have to worry about is what makes us, so many of us, feel powerless to be part of manifesting those solutions. That's what I'm, I'm focusing on, this spiral of powerlessness that starts with the premise of scarcity, that there's not enough of anything, goods or goodness. It sets in motion. I won't have time this, today to, to really go into this, but once we distrust ourselves, our capacities, and believe that we are just essentially selfish materialists, then of course we can't believe that we can come together in common problem solving and really figure this out together. And so we look for some infallible automatic force. And in this country, Ronald Reagan named it the magic of the market. Uh, the problem with that magic is it's one kind of market that continues to accumulate wealth to wealth. It's a one rule economy returning highest return to existing wealth. And so we end up, as we do in this country and now increasingly throughout the world, with massive concentrations of wealth that then infects and, in, and distorts the political process as money takes over. And so no wonder that we continue to subsidize fossil fuels in this country, for example. I'm just going to give you one number and come back to it again when I mention Germany a little bit later. But on a list of uh, a ranking of countries in terms of how much money controls the political process, do you know where the US ranks? We, uh, uh, one to 100, we rank right there equal with Tajikistan at 29. So remember that. <laughs> That's important. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that we stay within the spiral of powerlessness that we can't do this glorious opportunity, take advantage of glorious opportunities we're talking about today. So here, here's the deal, uh, that, um, that um, even environmentalists, and I'm not saying we in this room, but I think we need to be prepared to be aware that even a number of environmental messages are keeping us trapped in the spiral of powerlessness. Think for a minute about the idea, we've hit the limits of a finite Earth. We've hit the limit. I hear it a lot from my buddies in the environmental movement. What does that tell us? Wait, the problem is out there. It's nature skimpiness. No, 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 no. Uh, that, message, uh, that message, first of all, generates fear. And we know that fear brings out really bad things at us. It makes us more materialistic and self-seeking. But this, this, we've hit the limits of a finite planet, of course, is it keeps us in a quantitative frame. And as you all have been explaining to us so beautifully, uh, you know that, and you've heard this number, I'm sure I got it from the late beloved uh, Hermann Scheer, that the sun supplies 15,000 times the daily dose of energy that we're compared to what we're currently using. And you know that so well and say it so well. And so this, this quantitative barrier that is often in part of the environmental messages is really a danger. It's a danger also because in my world, in food in particular, if you hear we've hit the limits of a finite planet, you're vulnerable to think, oh, wow, then we need geoengineering. We need genetically modified seeds because we've gone as far as nature can go. We've got to do one better than nature. And so I think 
that we've, we've got to find our voices to reframe that hitting the limits of a finite planet, and equally so. Um, uh, the other part of the environmental message that I want to, that can keep us in the scarcity mind of fear and, and, and giving away our power is this notion that the only solution is no growth. I'm sure many of you have heard that. And, and again, I think it can be very problematic as one senses that, um, as one senses that, uh, um, that in fact, what we're doing now, we should not call growth. We should call it like it is, waste and destruction. And if we're blessing what we're doing now with the word growth and then saying, oh no, we don't need that, it's a very frightening uh, term. It's a very frightening frame for so many people in the world who need to feel that their jobs will be available to them. So I'm suggesting that there's much, even within common environmental movements, um, that can de deserve to be challenged gently but firmly and reframed in the positive way you all are talking. And I'm suggesting also that the, um, that the, um, that the scarcity mind fails us uh, not only because it, it um, leads us to um, this powerlessness, but it fails to meet these basic human needs of connection, meaning, and power, which is, of course, what I feel you all are actually tapping into. So I, I would say that the delight that I feel in being here and being alive with you in this moment is that more and more people are realizing the scarcity mind is not working. Do you know that suicides have increased um, by 65% worldwide in the last 45 years? Do you know that more people kill themselves than are murdered or die in war in the world today? Clearly, this scarcity mind that keeps so many people trapped in fear and believing they have to give over their power to some automatic market, it's not working. And so what is emerging and what I celebrate and honor you for being part of and leading is that we are moving from the three S's to the three C's. We are moving from the scarcity mind to what I love to call the eco mind, from uh, the, the idea of, of hitting the limits of nature to um, the theme of continuous, the three C's of continuous uh, change of connectedness and therefore of co-creation. So we can move to uh, aligning, instead of this limits frame, we can do what you all are talking about, which is shifting to the frame of alignment. And that then sets in motion um, a spiral of empowerment, because we start with the assumption that human beings, yes, we can be materialistic, and we can be competitive, and we can be even callous. But through eco-mind, we see that it is the context, like the first lesson of ecology, is the relationships to all that around us of what shows up. And so we see that, yes, we evolved over eons of time. Most of our evolution, we lived in tightly knit tribes where it was learning to cooperate that allowed us to flourish and certainly allowed us to get to 7 billion today. And so once we begin then to move into that spiral of empowerment, we see that we do have what it takes to create genuine democracy. We've heard a lot about Germany today. Let me just tell you, in that scale that I talked to you about, about the role that the nefarious role that money can play controlling public decisions. In Germ Germany, remember 29 we are down here? Germany is the top at 83 on the scale. Uh, so that is something that to me is explanatory about why cloudy Germany has become the global solar leader in many ways. And this is, this is a powerful um, way of um, seeing the Oh, sorry. You know what? I'm trying to, my notes are pushing my head here. Um, so, sorry. I'm hitting the keyboard. Um, so my point is, really, that, um, um, that with, um, with an eco-mind, we can move out of this frame of scarcity of goods and goodness and scarcity of of all of our needs, and move into what I call the 
a, a, what is called for in us then is what I love to call <clears throat> bold humility. That once we see the continuous change and our role as co-creators, we see that in fact uh, we are, have tremendous power. And this is why I love Don's Aiken's presentation. I will share that uh, delight in a moment. But we start with an eco-mind. There's so many dimensions to the power that we have that is veiled from uh, us in the scarcity mind. And so, um, so in the eco-mind, we start to realize that, um, that if we are all connected and change is the only constant, then we are changing each other moment to moment. We begin to discover the, the role of mirror neurons, for example, that as, as I'm doing something like this with my hands, there are actually neurons in your brains that are firing. So we can kind of understand how that one, uh, that one home uh, became 400 solar homes in just a few years, that the power that we have just ripples out. A wonderful book I just finished called Connection points out that we influence our friends directly, but then their friends, and then their friends, and uh, if you believe, as this, these authors do, that in the six degrees of separation, then we've already gone three rows out. We're sort of halfway around the world uh, in our influence, just through the choices that we are making. And so I, I delight in the discovery that we are not trapped within this scarcity mind, and that uh, we can then begin to recognize the power that we have. And a lot of it is coming from our social nature. Now, there is a downside. There is a downside to our social nature, however, and that is that we are so social. We are so social, it's very hard to break from the pack. But if the global hypertribe, so to speak, is heading over Victoria Falls right now, we do have to break from the dominant pack. And that's really scary. It's scary for most people to take risks. Uh, that could look, allow them to, uh, you know, cause them to lose standing with their tribe, so to speak. And so we have to be very conscious of this, that we are talking about actually transforming fear itself, and that we are talking about creating new tribes. In the companies that you're representing, the organizations that you're representing, it's of course not just a meaningful job that you're creating, meeting these deep needs that humans have, but you're also welcoming people into a new positive tribe that is based in the three C's of connection and continuous change and co-creation. That's what we need. And we can rethink fear as not something that has to stop us. Clearly, you haven't been stopped by risk aversion, you know? You have walked with your fear of maybe not, not working out. And we can do that. And we can recognize that fear is just pure energy. And I have a really corny gimmick that I thought of once when I, I was in an audience when Al Gore walked in with, um, on a debut of in, in, Inconvenient Truth, and all of my friends were sort of bowing and honoring him. And I was really angry that he didn't kind of nail it, bring it all the way home with what we have to do to change our politics. But my heart was pounding wildly. You know, I didn't want to stand up and be different from my friends and challenge. And at that moment, I said, okay, we've got to rethink fear. I'll just call that pounding heart inner applause. <laughs> And it kind of worked. It kind of worked. And, and so I'm, I'm suggesting then that with an eco-mind, this idea of continuous change, this bold humility I spoke of, the humility piece of it is this. We've got to be ready for surprises. We've got to be able to admit, I would have been the last person on earth, having grown up in Texas, to ever believe that my state could become a wind energy leader and even involve citizens, the utility companies even involve citizens in, in rethinking what their energy priorities were. Texas, my home state, no way that could ever happen, and it did. Um, I, I would never have imagined that Sierra Club, for example, could have, could have helped um, block the, destruct, the, the construction of a, now 168 coal plants. I would have said, no, that's not possible. And certainly, coming from Massachusetts, 10 years of hearing about Cape Wind do many of you know about all the effort to block offshore wind in, the, in Massachusetts? $30 million by one of the Koch brothers has gone against that, that construction of, the, of this um, wind farm offshore. 
and now it is going forward. If somebody had asked me to place bets on that one, I would never have imagined it could happen. So I think this idea that the eco-mind allows us to develop this bold humility of walking with fear and being ready for surprises, it sets us up for what I, I like to call myself not an optimist and not a pessimist, but, and I feel like I'm in the company of what I'm about to say, I call myself a possibilist. And this is what I mean is my um, conclusion, is that the greatest virtue of developing this mind that sees in connection and continuous change and sees the power that each of us then has, that it's not possible to know what's possible. And that's our power. And we can just go for it. And you are, and I honor you. Thank you. Thank you.